everyone. Uh, happy Saturday. Happy first full day of the IWBC Sabre Women's Conference. <laughs> nice. Uh, so um, we're going to get things started here. Uh, some announcements are to, while the presentations are going on, uh, please uh, silence your audio and turn off your video to conserve bandwidth. If you have any questions, you can just post them in the chat. Uh, the panelists will take them. I guess after they're done with the presentation, uh, time permitting. And um, yeah, I guess we're going to get things started here with uh, Donna Halper on early baseball women writers. So I'm very excited to go. All right, Donna, take it away. Okay, so first of all, what a privilege to be here. Isn't this cool? Um, I mean, <laughs> It is such a joy to be able to talk about this stuff with people because a lot of times as a friendly media historian, you talk about this stuff and people are like, is this important? Well, it's important to us. And uh, I, I just feel so privileged. So let me just get a couple of things organized here. And let me see if I can do the things I need to do. Can everybody see my screen okay? Excellent. Okay. So before I get started, how about a little context? Okay. This is a very famous Library of Congress photo. Um, and it's usually captioned that it's uh, some women fans. And it's a little bit more than women fans. Of course, here you have um, Jenny Veronica Murphy McKeever, who was the wife of Ed McKeever, one of the owners of the Brooklyn team, which in 1916, when this was taken, this was the Robins. And um, these are friends of hers. And they all took the train to Boston to root for the Brooklyn team against Boston when they were playing the Braves. It was a very common discourse in that era that if women were seen in the stands, it was because they were either married to a ball player, dating a ball player, their brother was a ball player. But the idea that women liked baseball, probably not. And yet here we have this photo of Elsie Viola Tidings. And she was a secretary, she was a stenographer in Washington, DC. And she loved baseball. And she stood in line for three hours when uh, the World Series tickets went on sale. And she was like the first in line. And of course, that was considered so unusual. I mean, a woman in line trying to get tickets, she must be getting them for her husband or her boyfriend. But Elsie was getting them for herself. She really, really loved baseball. But as I said, that wasn't the common discourse back then. Um, another thing that was very common was the idea that baseball was something that mainly, you know, because baseball was segregated, white women were the few women that you could see in the stands. And this historical photo from the Kansas City Historical Society um, shows that there were Black women that loved baseball as well. I mean, here we have the opening of the new stadium in Kansas City, which was the home of the minor league blues and also the Kansas City Monarchs. And of course, we have women in the crowd. And again, this is considered remarkable. So in light of all of that, let's get to one of the earliest women beat reporters that we know about, Ina Eloise Young. I've always been fascinated by this photo. It was taken in 1904. In Ina's era, women had to negotiate various kinds of spaces. In addition to the discourse that women were not fans, women were basically, you know, the wives of the ball players. Ina loved baseball from childhood, okay? In fact, we have some evidence that her father was a semi-pro player and it was her brother who taught her how to use a scorecard. But on the other hand, 
This is how she was expected to look, because another common discourse in the world back then was that if women were interested in sports, if they played sports, if they liked sports, they would lose their femininity. Ina has this photo taken probably by her family members, most likely her mother, and it is her official portrait and is used in the college yearbook and various other places. Most people think it was taken around 1904 when she was in her early 20s. And it shows that Ina is saying to the world, yes, I love baseball, but I'm still feminine. Now, she never has this conversation, but the image tells the story. And yet there's this image, which is the image she uses for articles like the one in editor and publisher about her. Ina loves sports. She loves riding and she's quite good at it. She gets involved in fencing. She gets involved in uh, girls basketball. And of course, while she never plays baseball, she really loves baseball. And she attends all the games. And one of the great disappointments of her life is she's never able to get her mother interested in baseball. Her mother goes, but more to make Ina happy. Ina, meanwhile, because of the fact that her father was a player and because of the fact that she knew everybody in Trinidad, Colorado, who was on the semi-pro baseball team there, she makes friends with a lot of the players, and she's perceived as quite knowledgeable about the game. Now, she had been a college reporter, okay? But she dropped out of school when her brother became ill. Her brother ultimately passed, unfortunately. But she learned everything about scoring and everything about the rules of the game from him, taking her from more than just a fan to someone who could really talk baseball. And when the Trinidad News, the local newspaper, needed someone to report on sports in 1905, Ina raises her hand and says, I can do that. She could. She did. She not only becomes a very, very well-respected sports writer, but she gets to cover baseball games all over the region including down in Denver, where she covers minor league baseball for the Grizzlies and even becomes their scorer sometimes. And Ina's work starts getting noticed. By 1907, she not only has the baseball beat in her small town, but she's being syndicated. And in 1908, she's sent to cover the World Series. And she's sitting up in the press box. Now, the men who see her in the press box, of course, immediately make the assumption, we have some of their writings so we know, um, they make the assumption she must be someone's girlfriend. And then Tim Murnane, the dean of the sports writers, comes up and just starts having a friendly conversation with her. He's, a, he's known for being a very courteous guy. He writes for the Boston Globe. And he finds that she really knows her stuff. And to his credit, he says so. He writes a column about how Ina is one of the most knowledgeable baseball writers, male or female. And Ina goes on for about mm, six years to cover baseball all over the region and even nationally, becomes widely known and widely respected. And yet, and yet, oh, those discourses, the discourse about women having to be feminine, Ina understands the world she's living in. When she goes to the game, she always makes sure she is meticulously dressed. She becomes very well known for her hats. And she also becomes known for her ability to, like I said, negotiate those spaces. When she talks to male reporters, she always speaks about like, oh yeah, she just doesn't want to talk current events. She doesn't believe in women's suffrage. She doesn't think she'll ever vote. Uh, years later, oh yes, she does. And that's another story for another day. But my point is in that day, 
1907, 1908, 1909, she's living the dream. She's reporting on baseball, but she's also able to kind of be a comfortable figure for the men who are the sports writers. We have no evidence that people rejected her about anything. In fact, she sat in the press box and there was no problem with it. Some of the biggest reporters of the day were friends of hers. And even years later, after she married, after she moved to the West Coast, she would still now and then talk about her career as a sports writer. And she would sometimes talk about how much she loved baseball and she continued to be a fan till the day she died. Now, here is a very interesting person. This is a 1918 shot of Ida McGlone Gibson when she went off to help the Red Cross during World War I, which of course back then was called the Great War because people didn't know there'd be a World War II. And Ida was kind of the 800-pound gorilla. Not that she was particularly large or in charge or anything like that, but she sat anywhere she wanted to. She was widely known. Ida McGlone Gibson was one of the best known reporters of her era. She got her start in the 1890s in Toledo, Ohio as a theater reporter and an entertainment columnist. But it turned out she loved baseball. Now, it never came up in conversation, but she was a celebrity interviewer, and some of the people she interviewed were the biggest and best-known names of her era. And so it was in 1912. And by this time, she's working out of the Midwest. She's in Chicago. But Ida gets asked to do a feature that male editors always thought was hilarious. They would send a female reporter to cover a baseball game from a women's perspective, as if women had a different perspective about baseball just because they were women. So Ida goes and covers the baseball game. Except with Ida, there's a problem. Ida's a celebrity interviewer. She is not someone who is unfamiliar with the game. And she not only goes to cover the game, but she gets to interview some of the biggest and best known players of her era. Among the players that Ida interviews in 1912 are a long list, including Joe Wood, Christy Mathewson, Jake Stahl, Jeff Tesro, John Muggsy McGraw. She talks to Muggsy twice. He wasn't happy about it either time, but he did it, okay? Then in 1916, she comes back with more interviews of baseball players. Uh, Wilbert Robinson, Zach Waite, Grover Cleveland Alexander. And yet, despite the fact that Ida McGlone Gibson is well-known as a fan and as somebody that really knows her baseball, she's always referred to as a lady baseball reporter or a woman baseball reporter rather than just a baseball reporter. But we do have a lot of her writings, and I was fascinated by the fact that she was able to claim a space that she wanted to be in, whether people wanted her there or not. Now, one of the unsung stories of women baseball writers in those early years is the Black press. And one of the first and one of the most respected African-American women to cover sports was Nell Dodson. Nell was later Nell Dodson Russell, but she was the first woman sports editor at the Baltimore Afro-American. She took the gig in 1938. In fact, she left college in her senior year to follow her dream and to be a baseball writer. She ultimately also covered other sports as well and covered them very well. Some of the information that we have about the Negro Leagues in the late 1930s, that's Nell. 
And Nell speaks her mind. She is not the kind of person that's just, oh my God, I can't believe I'm in the press box. She is in fact a really talented reporter. And she covers the Light Giants uh, and she covers the Homestead Grays and she covers the any of the Negro League teams that come through Baltimore or Washington. And she calls herself the lady in the press box. And she is in the press box. But she never forgets where she came from. And she talks about it sometimes. This is a cartoon of a young woman named Betty Murphy and her mother. When Nell was growing up, and Nell was raised in a very interesting home. She was raised by a single dad. Uh, her mother died when she was very young. And she was raised by her dad, who was very encouraging of her career. But Minneapolis, where they grew, where where Nell grew up, was de facto segregated. Not theoretically, like theoretically it was all equal, but in real life, eh, not so much. And when she went to the University of of uh, Minnesota, um, the dorms were segregated. And when black families would come to town, she and her father would open their home, kind of like a bed and breakfast, and invite people in so that they would have a place to stay. And Betty Murphy, years later, remembers how Nell Dodson and her dad, Lee, took them in and made them welcome. Nell went on to have a two decades long career in journalism. And baseball was only one of the many things she covered. She was an advocate for equality for Black athletes. She was a champion of women getting equal pay and Black athletes getting equal opportunities. And one of the forgotten women of sports writing, and she shouldn't be. Another was Willa B. Harmon. Now, Willa was born Willie B. Harmon, uh, never fond of the name. And when Dan Burley, one of the kings of African-American journalism, when he started calling her Willa, it was like, okay, fine. And then she embraced the name and she started calling herself Willa. Now, Willa B. Harmon was one of those people who had the fortune, the good fortune of meeting one of her sports writing heroes. She got to meet Faye Young of the Chicago Defender when he came and spoke at her school in Kansas City where she grew up. And he, he mentored her. And somebody else who mentored her was the great Negro Leagues pitcher, Dizzy Dismukes. And he basically taught her everything she needed to know about baseball. And she decided that, yeah, this sports writing thing, this could be okay. She started off as a general assignment reporter after she graduated college. She became fairly well known as a current events reporter, then an entertainment reporter. And then in 1943, she became a sports reporter for the Kansas City Call. And many of the articles that we have about the Kansas City Monarchs in the mid 1940s, Willa wrote them. And she covered Negro Leagues baseball all over the United States. But you probably have noticed the same thing in both my slide about Willa and my slide about Nell. No photos. And this is something, I'm gonna say this repeatedly, I think it's really sad that there are so few surviving photos of some of these early women baseball writers. I'm grateful that thanks to digitization, we have a lot of their writings. We don't even have all of them. I mean, the Kansas City Call, still not all digitized. But fortunately, I got friends at the library and they sent me some of her work. Um, that having been said, we're doing the best we can here to tell her story and to remember her, but I'm really hoping some photos will pop up at some time because it would really enhance my ability to tell the story. I do have a photo of Marion Foster Downer. This is in her later years. 
Marion Downer was married to Negro Leagues outfielder and later manager Fred Downer. And she was a society reporter, which women were expected to be. She was an entertainment reporter, which women were expected to be. She sometimes covered baseball and she loved baseball. And she also had the ability to meet and talk to anyone. And she did it for years. She covered the, the East West classic. She covered events that involved baseball. She also was kind of a celebrity journalist in her day. She befriended Marvel Lewis, Joe Lewis's wife. Marva wanted to be a singer and she was not exactly the best singer by most accounts, but just like um, Nell Dodson Russell and just like Willoughby Harmon got to follow their dreams, Marion followed hers and she was really supportive of Marva following hers. And she went out on the road with Marva on a number of occasions and we have a number of articles that she wrote. But it's her baseball articles that fascinate me because like I said, she was able to negotiate those spaces cover the game sometimes, but cover them from sort of a gossipy, friendly, you are there style. Let me leave you with something that really makes me sad. This is the gravestone, and I'm not trying to be morbid. You'll see where I'm going in a second. This is the gravestone of Pearl Kroll, later Pearl Kroll Brown. And she was Time Magazine's first female sports editor from about 1938 to 1942. And what's interesting to me is where Ina, Ina Eloise Young, and Ida, Ida McGlone Gibson, and either, even to some degree, Nell Dodson Russell and Willoughby Harmon, even though they were able to sit in the press box, Pearl never was. Pearl was not accepted as a sports writer. The baseball writers would not let her in. We know this because one writer who thought it was just wrong wrote about it. She had to pay her own way to the games. She had to sit in the stands, but she still kept covering the game. But Time Magazine, where she worked for so many years, through the 30s and into the early 40s, they have no pictures of her. And I think that's kind of sad. Somebody that covered sports and covered baseball for years. And all I could find was her gravestone. And I made a promise because it's right near where I live. I made a promise that I would tell her story. And so I am. And so I've told very briefly the stories of some of the early baseball writers who were women, who overcame the stereotypes, who overcame the myths. I mean, the myth that women just couldn't possibly be fans. Remember that song, Take Me Out to the Ball Game? The, the missing verse, of course, is the fact that it was about a female baseball fan who was either Katie Casey or Nellie Kelly, depending on which version of the song you've heard. But the song was about being a passionate baseball fan who wanted her boyfriend to take her out to the ball game. And these women, these women not only went out to the ball game, but they went out and showed that baseball could be covered and covered very well by women. Some were accepted, some were not, but all contributed to our understanding of what women could do in that era when women's roles were so limited, they took it on. And it's a privilege for me to tell their stories. Thank you. Great. Um, so you have, yeah, we have a little bit of time. Um, yeah, we have time. So actually, uh, looks like Leslie has a question. Uh, she says, great information about some amazing woman. Any idea why Pearl was treated so differently? Yeah, that's my, I have a hot theory and it's only a hot theory, okay? I think that Ina was treated 
fairly well because of the fact that she was young, she was very attractive by most accounts, and the male sports writers kind of looked at her like their daughter, and so they sort of like were very protective towards her. Ida McGlone Gibson, she was such a celebrity interviewer and so famous that nobody wanted to get on her bad side, okay? So she went wherever she wanted to go, thank you very much. But by the time World War II rolls around, I think there are some male sports writers that are being very protective of what they see as their space, and Pearl walks right into that, okay? And Pearl is kind of perceived as someone who doesn't know sort of her place. The women that covered the game in general back then didn't have a beat. They just kind of covered the game with a couple of exceptions in the Negro Leagues press. But even there, if the black women who covered the game wanted to go into, let's say, a white press box, I don't think they would have been allowed in. In the case of Pearl, she just wanted the right to go where the guys went. But by that time, like I said, I think there were people that were just claiming their space. We're going to see this throughout the 40s and 50s. And even when I go to college and I want to be a sports writer, I am told that girls can't do that. And I was told that in 1964. So that belief was still baked into the culture. And, you know, again, just a hot guess. But I really do feel like the ones that were perceive, perceived as sort of like a one-off, fine. But during the war, you've got sort of a trend. And here come the women trying to take these jobs. And in fact, in my book, and I don't mean to shill for my book, but in, in Invisible Stars, A Social History of Women in American Broadcasting, which two editions, I'm working on a third, God willing. In that book, I kind of address the fact that some of these stereotypes about the women really are dependent on the era they were in. And if you were perceived as a novelty, you were okay. But if you were perceived as part of a trend, oh, you were not okay. Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, you even see that sometimes today with, you know, groundbreaking people who just want to be the only one um, as opposed to, and you saw that with a, uh, um, just any time there's someone breaking in, there'll always be like, it's tokenism, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. And the other, the other thing that's really forgotten is how a lot of, particularly in the African-American press, the black press, um, Nell Dodson, later Nell Dodson Russell, and Willoughby Harmon, like all the men sports writers, they not only reported about sports, they reported about racism, and they were very upfront about it. They navigated both spaces and they navigated them in a very forthright manner. And they wanted equal opportunity for the black athletes and they said so. But the other thing that's interesting is they called out Negro League players. They called them out when they saw sloppy play, when they felt like people weren't taking the game seriously. They were not just like, you know, shills for the team. Yeah, they were glad to be there but they acted just like their male counterparts. They loved baseball and they wanted to see the game respected. And in a way, I suppose they wanted to see themselves respected too. Yeah, so I hope that was praise. okay. Did I, yeah. did I do all right? Was I? You're getting a ton of praise. You can read it like you can read it afterwards, but yeah, this is getting rave reviews. I'm just seeing if there's any more questions here. <laughs> I think it's mostly just... And if this people awesome. do have questions, yeah. I, I was trying to keep my uh, thing short because for yeah. uh, courtesy, but if people have other questions, I've been researching these women for years. In a couple of cases, I've written Sabre bios about mm -hmm. them, and you can just look on the Sabre site and you can find them. In other cases, just shoot me an email and I'll tell you where my research is going. And I'm always happy to share because these are women whose stories deserve to be told. Well, how much do you know about uh, women outside of um, like the, the period when they were actually sports writing? I mean, some of them, it seems like that's pretty much where it begins and ends. Do you seem to find that? I have a lot of information about their lives. 
I try very hard to preserve like who they were, what they were doing, and that in some cases, covering sports was just one aspect of their lives. But I got to say this one thing, Tara, that really also makes me sad, in addition to the lack of pictures. Ina Eloise Young, the first really well-known beat writer who covered baseball for like six and a half years when she died, not even an obit not even an obit, okay? And that's the case with Willa. That's the case with Nell. That's the case with Pearl. That's the case with Ida. Ida got an obit. In fact, it even made the New York Times, but it was all about her work as an advice columnist and on the women's pages. And the fact that she interviewed baseball players for years, you never would have known. So like I said, I, I try to tell as many of these stories and whenever I can find a new one, I'm all about making sure they get told. But why did they get so little respect in their era? It just makes me sad. It is. Well, this is a very fascinating topic for me, but we are running over. So yeah, yeah, unfortunately, we have to curtail this, but Donna, this is wonderful. You've given us a lot to think about. Somebody posted a link to your book, it looks like. Um, so and, and yes, anybody that yeah. wants to get in touch, I'm fine about it. And if there's other questions, just seriously, dlh at DonnaHalper.com or you can reach me through Sabre. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.